such faithful to the association. You are faithful in, in doing and giving. Uh, I just say thank you. It's been a little bit uh, back in April, that last Sunday, April 23rd, we had the revival at Trace Creek, and you guys did a great job. Uh, had counselors, you guys, social media and uh, promotion and all kinds of stuff. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. You pray with us as we look towards the next revival, what God wants us to do in this association. But thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Brother Keith, for inviting me, letting me come. Anytime you get an opportunity to stand and share God's Word, that's a blessing, amen. That's a, that's a privilege, and it's an honor uh, to be able to do that. And I don't take that lightly. And I, uh, Even as I'm in this role that I'm in now, I've, I've pastored and been in ministry for almost 30 years now, and uh, I'm just thankful for where I am today and here in, in, in Grace County. We've got a great association, and you guys are a great part of that. And Brother Keith kind of gave me a tour of the, the new uh, worship and everything. That's just beautiful. I last seen it probably about a year ago. He walked me through there. So excited, excited for y'all. I know y'all are excited to, to get in that new building and get to in there. I mean, it's going to be awesome. Of course, I know you guys are packing this place out. So that is awesome. That is awesome. Well, as we look at Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26, and let me say this before we read the passage of Scripture. As we look at it, I hope as we read this passage of Scripture, as we delve into this passage of Scripture, that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that for those of us that are children of God, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and that Holy Spirit would place upon our hearts, place upon our hearts a desire, a longing, a passion for at least one person is lost. Tonight's message and lesson is a very practical message. You know, I find that so often, and yes, there are some difficult passages in the Word of God. There is some deep stuff. But what I have found, and I have to say for myself included, is that a lot of it's not real deep. It's just that we don't want to do it. We don't want to apply it, okay? We just say, well, you know, that's kind of hard to understand. And that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, a signal for that we really don't want to do it. But this passage of Scripture, we can apply it. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants to delve in. He wants us to find the truth of the Scripture. Now, I say the truth of the Scripture, God's truth, and I say that because in this day and time, as each of us well know, most people say, well, i got my truth and you got your truth, and we'll just kind of agree to disagree. Not according to the Word of God. It is God's Word. It is God's truth. And it is just as relevant today as it has been for many, many years. So, and I say that, about a passion for one, because, and I'm just as guilty, uh, we say, and this is, this is fine, okay, don't get me wrong, but we'll say we're praying for the lost. Well, that doesn't really get us a burden to get out there. We're like, and that, that's great. But what I want us to do, because in this passage of Scripture, we're going to see some guys. They do whatever it takes to get that one guy to Jesus. So what I want us to do tonight after we delve in here, I want us to leave here with a passion for at least one person. Because every single one of us here tonight, we know at least one person that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Could be a friend, could be a family member, it could be, could be a neighbor, whoever that might be. Because as we'll see here, as I said, these guys will do whatever it takes, they did whatever it took to get that friend to Jesus. If you can stand with me. Let's read Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. And they sought means to, br means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up on the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, In my end, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, 
What reason in your heart? Whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sin. And he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine hand. And immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we come to you, what an awesome privilege it is to be in your word, because your word is alive, it is real, it is relevant. So Lord, I pray you just set me aside. You just set me aside and you speak in a mighty way. Speak to our hearts, speak to our lives, Lord, and I pray that we leave here changed, that we leave here on fire for you, and that we have a passion to see at least one person saved, and that we'll do whatever it takes to get those folks to you. Lord, and I thank you so much for Chief Cornerstone. Lord, I thank you for the keys. Thank you for the staff. Thank you for the leadership. Thank these folks have been so gracious to me and, and my dear wife, Lord Annette. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for their giving to the association, their participation. What a great church, Lord, and it's exciting. Lord, it's Vacation Bible School, Lord. You know it's very near and dear to my heart, Lord. I remember. I remember my son coming home, Lord, uh, one night after a Vacation Bible School, and he received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, Lord. And I praise you for that as he's an adult young man now, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that this church will see many young men and young ladies come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ this week. And give strength, give help to the workers, Lord. We know it's a long week, it's a tiring week, but Lord, we know you're going to bless, and bless us here. And it's in your name we ask it. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we know, as we study the Gospels, as you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus went from place to place. And as he went from place to place, he was teaching, uh, he was doing ministry, and as he did that, who was he always running into? Religious leaders. And you know, they were always excited to see Jesus. No, they did not like anything about him. Uh, what Jesus was teaching and what he was sharing was completely against what they were being taught, what they were teaching. Of course, they were teaching what they were coming up with. They were, they were hypocritical about all that they did. But Jesus shares with them that he is, as John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to Father but through me. You know, those religious leaders, they were saying you had to go through the law, you got to go through all these hoops. And so Jesus says, I am the way. He was sharing. They don't like it. They don't even like what he's teaching and sharing. And, of course, they had spent so much time defining laws, discussing laws, and, I mean, uh, they had accumulated over 400 years in that time span between the Old Testament and New Testament, and they were coming up with their own additions and their own interpretation of the law. And they were very concerned, as you know from studying the Gospels, uh, tradition. Tradition, they were steeped in tradition. Now, don't get me wrong, tradition is good, but I find often as Christians in churches, we get very much caught up in tradition. Sometimes, uh, if we're not careful, tradition trumps the Word of God, you know, and, and we think, oh, we've just done that for years, and we're like, no, it's not even in the Word of God, so we got to be careful, and we, in fact, we lose sight of Scripture. Losing sight of Scripture so often is because we're embracing man-made traditions, and of course, these Jewish leaders, they felt threatened, uh, they felt threatened because Jesus, he was challenging the status quo. He was, stat he was challenging them because, and they didn't like the fact that Jesus was drawing large crowds because they wanted to be the ones to tell everybody what they were supposed to do. Well, in this story, as we see, you got some guys. They've got a friend. He's paralyzed. And what do they do? They try to get him in the house to lay him before Jesus. You see there in verse 18, And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken paused, and they sought means to bring him in to lay him before him. Well, they couldn't find a way. So what do they do? What do they do? They go up on the rooftop, right? They go up on the rooftop to get him in there. They lower him down in the crowd. There it says, verse 19, tells us right there in front of Jesus. And of course, what you love, when Jesus sees their faith, he says, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. 
Now, of course, those guys, they were getting their friend to Jesus because they wanted to get him healed. What they didn't realize is that he needed spiritual healing first and foremost. That's what's most important. Now, I'm all for praying for people to get physical healing. Pray all the time. I know we have our prayer list. or long, and we pray for people, and we've seen God do miraculous things physically. But, you know, a person can get uh, physically healed but still be lost and die in a, a body that we think is good, physically good, and spend eternity in hell. So God wants us to understand the importance is that a person is forgiving. Well, as we see in this passage of Scripture, we see that, and, and I just kind of imagine, uh, Jesus is large crowds there, and I can just envision these Pharisees and teach, they're in the back, you know, and they're kind of standing there, and they got their little books, and they're taking notes, and you can see them whispering, you know, like, I can't believe that he's doing that. I can't believe that he's saying those things. You know, he, he's speaking blasphemy, you know. You know, only, only God can forgive sins. Well, you love it. I, I love this because when we see this in other passages of Scripture, Jesus knows what they're thinking, right? He knows exactly what they're thinking. And you, you got to love as he begins to, as, they, as they're thinking, and, and I just kind of think maybe they were kind of con conversing, trying to be quiet. Jesus interjects into their conversation. He lets them know in verse 22 what they're thinking. I, I would, wouldn't you just like to be a fly on the wall to see that happening and see the, the, the looks on their face that here he is, he knows what they're saying. What Jesus does in this story is he does something that the people could see. He does that so that they might understand and believe what they could not see. You know, we've all heard the expression, seeing is believing, right? You know, you show me and I will believe. Jesus Christ wants us to, he wants us to see something physically in order for us to understand spiritually. This man, he desperately needed physical healing, but most important, he needed spiritual healing. And that's what Jesus wanted everybody there. Uh, he wanted the crowd. He wanted, he wanted everybody there, the, the man, his friends. He, he wanted the, the religious leaders. He wanted uh, everybody to see that the most important thing is the forgiveness of sin, that a person needs to be forgiven of their sin. They need to be right with God. And as you look there, let's look again at verse 23 through 26. I, I, I love that there. He says, whether he, as he begins that conversation, and backing up verse 22, he says, But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easy to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man had power upon earth to forgive sins. You know, we know that Jesus is God Almighty here on the earth. And he said in the sick of palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy couch and go in thine house. You notice that spiritual healing first, most important, and then he physically healed there. And immediately he rose up, and of course it just shows you the power of God. He was immediately healed and took up that where he lay and departed to his own house. And I love this, glorifying God. Man, when you meet Jesus, when you truly meet Jesus, and you come face to face with who God Almighty is, your life is changed, and you glorify God. You know, when you can't uh, glorify God, there, you might want to check things out. Do you know the God that is to be glorified? And they were all amazed. See, when God does something, people see. They watch. And I wonder, as we look at the world that we live in, the reason that many lives aren't being changed, are they not seeing that we that profess to see Jesus Christ, our personal Savior, they're not seeing us glorifying God. Because you see here, there are people in all different walks. They were all amazed, and they glorified God. And they were filled with fear, a reverence. This is God of us. We have seen strange things today. Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, as I said at the beginning, uh, it's important that we delve in and get the truth here, and we see that the truth is that someone, uh, that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone saved. He was, it was saved, folks. And that's what he came here for, and that these friends were getting their uh, getting their. Getting the people, men were getting a friend to Jesus so that he get healed physically, but more importantly, spiritually. So as we look at that, it's important for us to think about, as I said, that one, that one person that you have that is lost. 
So as we put this into practice, so there are some things as we break this down to talk about. First of all, the first thing is, as we know, these men, they brought their friend to Jesus. They brought Jesus, and, they, and in that they had a mission. And a mission, that defines us, does it not? If we, you know, it, it gives us focus. It gives us purpose. It gives us direction. It, it gives us direction in our life. What we find for most people in, in this day and time, even folks that are in church, have no direction in their life, have no mission, have no guidance in their life. They're just kind of going here and there and whatever the world has to offer, they're running over here and they're running over here and they had no purpose. But these guys right here, they had a mission. And their mission was to get their friend to Jesus. Nothing was going to stop them. See, for us, a mission gives us direction in our culture. And we desperately need to know what the mission is because you turn on your TV, you go on social media, you look all around, it tells us a completely different focus, what we need to focus on, contrary to the Word of God. And we need to know that God is where our focus should be. Now, you think about the jobs that you have. Think about maybe your business. Think about, um, say you're working on a project, and you start to go outside, and, and you know, you've got a business that does certain things, and the other business does this, and we sell this, and we're folk, we make this, and we do that. And so your business is focused, and this is the mission, and you go outside of that mission, well, your boss comes along and says, hey, 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 you know, that's a good thing, but that's not our mission. Say you're building a house, okay? You're building a house. Of course, the first thing you've got to have in a house, you've got to have a foundation, right? First and foremost, you've got to have a foundation. And as most of you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a builder, but I see folks building, but you've got a foundation. You've got somebody that does the plumbing. You've got somebody that does the electricity. You've got somebody that paints. You've got somebody that does the trusses. You've got people that do all different things. But say your job, your job is to build the foundation. And, of course, obviously, in, in parallel to us as Christians, we've got to have a, a foundation upon Jesus Christ, right? Amen? As you go to the job site the first day, you got, you're out there on the land, you're going to build a house, and your job is to build a, the foundation. And you walk out there the first day, and you take a toilet, and you set it right there in the middle of the field. Now, I don't know about you, but I enjoy indoor plumbing. Some of us are old enough, we remember when there was indoor plumbing. A, you know, a toilet's a good thing, right? You've you got to have toilets. But is that toilet, is that the mission to focus at that time? No, it's a good thing. But the mission at time is to build the foundation. So in saying that, what happens to us in our individual lives and in church, you know, we do a lot of good things. Hey, that seems like a great thing, and we'll run off on that, and then we'll run off on that. But we get off mission. We get off track. And, you know, just like that foundation, the boss walks out there and said, listen, we're going to have to have that. It's a good thing that you got that toilet, but we got to build a foundation first. We've got a lot of things we're supposed to do. We've got, a, we've got a mission. So they reel you back in. They remind you of what the mission is. And they say, that's a good thing. But we've got the mission to focus on. Now, how many of you on Instagram? I'm not on Instagram. How many on Instagram? Okay. Not many of you are. Few, okay, a few of you. Well, I read where the mission of Instagram is to capture and share the world's moments. And I know Instagram, Facebook, they kind of do the same thing. What most people do, they pull out their phone, they take a picture, and they post it on Instagram, right? They post it on Facebook. And I mean, that's the goal. That's the goal of Instagram, Facebook and stuff. Uh, it's uh, what I found now is that Facebook, especially as a, as a grandparent is, that's how you find pictures of your grandchildren. I mean, that's, isn't that right? Isn't that right? You want to find pictures. So there's a focus. There is a... Uh, there's a, a mission in what they're doing. You know, uh, in this world, all these different things, they have a mission, and they have a focus, and they're trying to get you to buy in to what they're doing. Why? I'm just blown away how we as Christians, we've got the Word of God, we've got a mission, we've got a focus, but we're going all over the place. But there's a world out there, you have conversation, they are out, 
to change the way we think about things, the way we do things, and to make us believe their way. Amen? I mean, we see that. So we need to stick by the Word of God. Jesus himself had a mission statement. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to this earth to live a sinless, perfect life, to die on the cross, shed his innocent blood for you and me, to pay a sin penalty for you and I so that every single one of us can have an opportunity to have a relationship with him. I try to make sure that every message, every lesson that I share that because I believe it is important for us to be reminded of that. Because as you think about it, if you ask the question, why didn't Jesus heal everybody? Do you ever think about that? Why did he not heal everybody? I mean, the pool of Bethesda, John chapter 5, you were to turn there. Uh, he heals the guy there, but the Bible says there was a great multitude of people. There was a lot of people there. And you see that often. He didn't heal everybody. Well, these men, in this story, they had a mission. They understood their mission, and it was to get their friend to Jesus so he could be healed and walk. That mission, it moved them. It drove them. So in that, let me ask you a question. What drives you? What motivates you? What makes you get up in the morning? Of course, you're going, well, the alarm goes off, and it goes off again and again, and finally I realize that i got to get up, and i got to go to work. Or my kids are up, and i got to get them to school. I know it's vacation, but think about what pushes you. I mean, what moves you forward in life? Now, is it that, you know, you want to have a good job? Uh, is it that you want an early retirement? Is it so that, you can leave a good inheritance to your children. All those things sound good. I mean, doesn't God, he wants us to work, right? He, he, we, he don't want to be lazy. He wants us to work, and he wants us to provide for our family. Those, those are great things. You know, it's great to, you know, to, to want to leave for the next, the next generation. But let me ask this question in a different way. What things spiritually speaking, are driving you. You know, we, if we are truly a child of God, there's truly been a time in your life when you placed your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You had the Holy Spirit to live within you. You're a part of the kingdom of God. So what kingdom, the kingdom of God, what kingdom dreams do you have? What is moving you in such a way that you're not just living for the moment, but you're living for eternity? Because I would think that we would agree that most people today are living for the moment, wouldn't you say? You know, take care of me now, I'll worry about things later. But when we're talking about kingdom, when we're talking about living for Christ, it's about eternity. And have you noticed, I know I have, and I've really been guilty of this, have we noticed that we spend a lot of time on stuff and acquiring stuff that doesn't last? Uh, we were blessed a few years ago. We bought a new car. Well, you know, everybody's had buys cars, and they eventually wear out, don't they? They eventually have problems. You can build a new house, and it begins to wear out. Clothes, they, they wear out. But have you noticed? That's what we spend our time on, stuff that doesn't last. Parents, let me ask you this. What things spiritually are motivating you about your children? What desires do you have for your children? It, do you truly have a desire that your children come to faith in Jesus Christ at a young age? Because if you truly desire that they get saved at early age, then every day you are seeking to show your children, let them see the beauty of the gospel. And they have to see that through you. And you have to be living out your faith 
in front of them. They, they need to see that when you are making decisions, that you're turning to God, that you're turning to His Word for answers and not to whatever the latest talk show is or whatever uh, on social media and whatever is most popular. Because if we truly desire that our children come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at a young age, then we're going to work hard at it. And that's going to be the mission that defines you. So what is it that's driving you for the kingdom of God? Now, I will back up, and I might get on my soapbox just a little bit on this. I pastored for several years, and I would see families that would... I mean, they would be in church. They would be serving God. They'd be bringing those children to church. And then they would get saved and they'd get baptized. And then we wouldn't see them anymore. It's kind of like they gave their children fire insurance. And I am a uh, sports nut. I love sports, played sports most of my life. But what I see in the world that we live in, sports has become a god. It has become... And I realized that when I was growing up that, you know, sports didn't happen on Sunday. They didn't happen on Wednesday. And it's like we almost fear like, well, our children will not get to participate. I learned as I was raising my children and I, my daughter, she was in band and we would be one, two o'clock in the morning band competitions on Saturday nights. But I said, we're going to church. In church, and I had folks in my church. They didn't. They didn't come. My son, he played on the golf team. They would practice on Wednesdays, and I said, "That's great, as long as when it's time for church, I'm coming to pick up my son." We're so worried about that our children will miss out when we really should be worried about them missing out on something about the Word of God. I say this, and my children are, are grown, and I'm, I'm greatly blessed, and have grandchildren, and. I guess I can say some of these things because my children are, are grown and now. But what I saw often was that families would be running all over the world, all over the place, getting their kids and this and that and getting this and that. And uh, God and church was second. And then when they got to be old enough to kind of make their own decisions, uh, they would choose not to go to church. And I would have folks come and say, I just don't understand it. Just don't understand it, Brother Mike. I just can't get them to go to church. And I'd say, well, when they were seven, eight, nine years old, when you had to opt in, ten years old, what were you doing with them? You know, I, I find that we want to live through our children, and obviously nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong uh, with that, but we're letting so much of the world dictate what we do. If we truly want our children to know the Lord, we need to show them the things of the Lord and what's most important. And yes, they may not be the most popular, but you know what I found out? If you're a good player, it don't matter if you left to go to church, you're going to play. I mean, I found that to be. I mean, you know, God takes care of those things. He just does. We need to trust God and believe God. I know there's a lot of young families here, but I just, uh, you know, I saw that, that just in this world, chasing, uh, you know, travel ball and stuff. See, I get to see all this stuff and I can leave. You know, Brother Keith's got to make, he's got to take care of all this. But when they're young, you've got to show them that God's important and that he's important to you. Your mission has got to be as a parent that your children know God. And not just know God, but know how to go to God and make decisions. You know, it's alarming to me the number of kids, students, leaving, and these are kids that grew up in church, that go to college and are walking away from the faith. I saw it as my kids were growing up. I mean, these were kids that were in the church that I pastored. Some of my son's best friends, they went off to college and they did not have a care in the world about the things. But as you look back, 
They were chasing everything else. They did not, parents did not show them. They just show what they show. And I, I use the illustration of a chest of drawers. You know, you got your chest of drawers for, for God, and you got it for school, and you got it for work, and you got it for hobby. Another whatever you want to fill in. So on Sundays, what do we do? We pull God out of that drawer. We got God on. We go home, stick him back in the drawer, then we pull out the word. Now, is that being a Christian? Is that living for Christ? I don't know about you, but this book says you surrender all. This past week, I had the privilege of going with First Baptist to, and some others to Arizona mission trip, and our theme was all in, all the time. Amen? All the time. It's not just a part-time thing. And our children, they need to see that. They need to see that we're all in for God. And as they grow up, they grow up to know that God is first and foremost. I may mention of stuff that we chase after. May we be reminded that Jesus didn't die for stuff, did he? What did he who did he die for? He died for people, didn't he? People is what matters. And uh, I know Brother Keith's done a lot of funerals. I've done a lot of funerals over the, de- over the years. And uh, i tell you a little secret. I know this is a little bit morbid, but the casket's there and the family's gone out at the end of service, but the ministers stay there with the funeral directors. And they'll have on a watch. They'll have on rings. You know what? They take all that stuff off. Even that stuff you think you're going to take with you, it doesn't happen. I mean, it just doesn't happen. It comes off and gets handed to the family. Now, you heard about the man who uh, said, I want all my money in the casket. Put all my money in the casket. You heard about that. What the wife did, she says, before they closed the casket, she said, pull all that money out, and she laid a check in that casket. <laughs> my wife always says, you might want to run those by me before you share them. In this passage of Scripture, these men... The driving force, their motivation was that their lame friend get to God. As a child of God, of course, I hope in, that your desire is to become more like Christ. So are you seeking to become more like Christ? And if you are, why not take on the mission of God? That God would use you and I that the lost might be found. That God would use us as an ambassador of the gospel. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 through 21, and we'll, we'll focus in on verse 20. I know you are turning there. And all things are of God who has reconciled us by himself, by Jesus Christ, and given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto him, not imputing the trespasses unto him, and has committed us the world of tra- reconciliation. Verse 20 is where we're left. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ said, Be ye reconciled to God. And he goes on to say, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I think we all know what an ambassador does. It's amazing how God in his word will use illustrations, he'll use examples that we can relate to. That's God. He knows that we can relate to an ambassador. An ambassador, you're an ambassador for the United States, you're over in another country, representing the United States of America, and you're over there. Now, if you were to be over that country, and you're the ambassador of the United States, and you decide, you know what? I have my own way of doing things. Forget the United States, but I'm going to do things my own way. I see it this way, and I think we should do it that way. You're going to get fired. You're going to be on the plane back to the United States. So God uses us to be an ambassador of the gospel because we are his representatives here on this earth. We talk a lot about the weather. We talk a lot about the sports. We talk a lot about a lot of stuff. But God desires that we talk about him, that we talk about the glory of God, and we talk about what he's doing in our lives because that's contagious because as people hear us talk about man god is moving in my life god is doing this and we glorify god and people go i want what you got but we just don't do it we don't talk about it we talk about things that we want to talk about well 
These men had a mission. It was to get their friend to Jesus. Is there some along that we take a break or we just keep rolling? Roll. Keep rolling. All right, good deal. All right. Number two, not only did they have a mission, they had an eager expectation. You know, they didn't go like, oh, yeah, that's great. We got a vision. We got a, got a mission. Uh, sounds great. Hey, we got the T-shirt. No, they're like, this mission, it moves us. It moved them to an expectation. If we can get our friend to Jesus, then Jesus and Jesus alone can heal them. Now, these men were taking a risk. They are taking a risk on God, weren't they? And when I think about risk, anybody heard of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Okay, we heard that story. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Let's, let's look a little bit at Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. I, I love this story, and I, lo- I love the Bible stories in the Old Testament. You know, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel in the lion's den, David and Goliath. I mean, I was that weird little kid in Sunday school and just loved those stories, ate them up. But what's neat is, and what's important for us, I'll just say this backing up as parents and teaching children is that we teach them those stories of the Bible. I'm finding that people aren't growing up in knowing those stories. And as they learn those stories and as they learn them and they grow up, they begin to learn there's so much more there, there's so much more truth that God is trying to teach us. Well, most of us probably know the scenario here in Daniel chapter 3. The king, King Nebuchadnezzar, he makes this golden image and he says when the music plays, everybody bow down. Well, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they don't bow down. So, of course, you know, there's always somebody going, hey, king, those guys over there, they ain't bowing down. They're supposed to bow down, king thought. I'll bring them in. Maybe they just don't quite understand what's happening. So they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in, and king says, you know, here's the deal. You bow down when the music plays. You bow down to the golden image. And if you don't bow down to that golden image, you're going to get thrown into the fire furnace, and you're going to burn, and you're going to die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, King, we're not going to bow down. We only bow down to the one true God. We only bow down to God Almighty. We're not bowing down to your golden image. We only bow down to God Almighty. King says, understand something, you're going to get thrown in the fire. And of course, as you read scripture, it was, what, ten times hotter, and even burnt the guys trying to fire it up. They get put in the fire furnace. Of course, before that, they said, listen, King, we believe that our God is going to save us. Our God is going to take care of us. And as I see that, I mean, that's a strong faith. I mean, that's the kind of faith that we're supposed to have. We're to say, God, I know you're going to be there. I know you're going to take care of me. But as the story goes, in verse 18, I love this, okay? They, they're saying God is going to take care of us, but then in verse 18, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I saying, listen, you throw us in the fire, we perish, and we not, we're, we're still not bound down to your golden image because we worship God. And, of course, we know the story. Of course, it's a whole different, another message that fourth person shows up in that fire, amen? And they're saved. God delivers them. God takes care of them. And because of their faith and because of their stance, because of their testimony, and not wavering, not compromising, it changes the king, it changes the whole nation. They're told to bow down to the one true God from now on. And as I think about that story, and I think about us, and probably myself, really more myself, you got the three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're standing there, And the king is saying to them, guys, if you don't bow down, you're going to be thrown in the fire furnace and you're going to die. 
Most of us, and maybe not you, but as I think about myself in that situation, if I'm one of the guys, I'd look over at the other guy and say, you know what? God's been doing some good things in my life. He's, he's been using me, and we're young. And surely God doesn't want us to die. Surely he doesn't want us to, to really go that far. Surely he really doesn't want us to go that far. And You know, if we, we compromise this just one time, just one time, I mean, surely God will understand if we compromise one time and we bow down. I mean, God will understand. Isn't that what we do a lot of times in our walk with the Lord? We get challenged and we compromise. Surely God will understand. Matter of fact, you know, I kind of deserve a break. I've really been good. I've been faithful. I've been doing things the Lord wants me to do, and I've been faithful, but you know, I need a break. And we begin to compromise. And what happens is, we compromise once, and what we find out, we don't just compromise once. We compromise, then we compromise again, and we compromise again and again and again, and we wind up in a place in our life and we look back and we say, I never thought I would be here. What happened to me? Well, it started with the compromise. Yeah, we were challenged. Yeah, it was difficult. It wasn't easy. It wasn't hard. I mean, here, these three guys, I mean, they're facing death. I mean, who wouldn't say, you know, whoa, I don't know about this. I'm not sure I, you know, I have that kind of faith. I, God, surely, you understand, you don't want me to die. You're not done with me here, are you? But not these guys. Because can you imagine, as I think about this story, if they compromise, and, they, and one of them said, hey, look, look, let's just bow down this one time, then what would that have said to that king, to that nation, and everybody watching? That God's not real. And you know, the story would be, we could see the story would be that they would have to worship this golden image from then on. Why would anybody worship God Almighty? It's a compromise. And as I think about that, how often do we compromise? Because I, you know what I found? There's always people watching. There's always people watching. I had a situation just, just the other day in, in handling something, and uh, as I... I'll be honest, in, in the back of my mind, I was getting a little irritated with it. And uh, it wasn't happening the way I thought it should happen. I know none of you ever had those moments. I know you're all very cool, calm, collective, and you know, everything rolls just fine. But things weren't just moving along like I thought they should move. And I was just about to say something that probably I may regret. I know none of y'all had those moments. I know y'all are real spiritual, and you never had those moments. But I had those moments. All of a sudden, the person there behind the counter says, Oh, yeah, you preached at our church a few weeks, didn't you? And I was getting ready to preach the next day. And if I'd said probably what was on my mind, that person probably might not have been at the church when I went. And, you know, I felt like I was justified, right? It needed to be said, right? No, it didn't. I just about lost my testimony over something stupid. And we'll say, oh, I, you know, they, they, they need to know. No, 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 no. There are people watching. They're watching. Let's not compromise. Let's not compromise. Let's stand true to the Scripture. Because the gospel... It transforms lives. And people need to see that. It transforms minds. It transforms hearts. It, it moves us. It impacts us. The gospel moves us forward. And yes, as we move forward, we are going to encounter obstacles. Christ never said, matter of fact, he said... Standing up for him, surrendering all, is not going to be easy. He said it wasn't, going to, it wasn't for the weak. 
And you've got to give it all, and you've got to make sacrifice. You've got to make commitment. But again, we talked earlier about are we living for the moment, or are we living for eternity? For sure, some of us, we've been on this earth a little longer, and we see how quickly time flies and how life speeds on, that life is short. And more and more we realize that this world is, is temporary for us. But yet we are consumed with this world. And God wants us to have heavenward focus. And yes, we're going to face obstacles. And as we look at this story, for most of us, if we were these men in this story and we get to that door and it's packed out, we're gonna, most of us are going to say, it's a closed door and we go home. And we walk away. For most of us, if we get real honest, an open door is Christianese for the path of least resistance. You know, open door terminology for most of his Lord, I will walk through that door because it seems easy. I will walk through that door because everything I think is going to be okay. There's not going to be challenges. I'm not going to be any difficulties. And as I think about that for a moment, we heard of a guy named the Apostle Paul. I think we've heard of him. If the Apostle Paul had only walked through open doors, doors that seemed easy, half the New Testament wouldn't have been written. I mean, what are some things that we know that Paul went through? He was flogged, he was beaten. He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. Now, does that sound like an open door to you? Not to me. Not to me at all. Hey, Paul, don't go to Rome. Of course, God told him to go to Rome. And they said, listen, Paul, you go to Rome. Guess what's going to happen? Yeah, they're going to kill me. I know that. I know they're going to kill me. I know that's what they're saying. And that's probably going to happen. But you know what? I'm going anyway. And I'm going because God told me to go. I find that in my walk with the Lord that many times when things are easy, then I might want to check where the, what it is because when God tells you to do something, it's, it's going to be hard. Because when it's hard, you know where you're looking? You're looking up at God. When it's easy, you, just, you say, look at me. I got this all figured out. But when it's hard, you're saying, God, I cannot make it a step, another step without you. And that's what God wants. So sometimes when there is a closed door, we need to dig a hole in the roof. That's what these guys did. They didn't give up. They got up on the roof. They, had, they improvised. They found another way to get their friend to the feet of Jesus. They didn't give up. They didn't say, oh, it must be a closed door and go back to their merry way. As I said, we're going to encounter obstacles when we try to share Jesus with others. And some of these you're thinking about that one, that one person that you, you need to do every, whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. You're probably saying, I've shared with them several times. And they've argued with me. They don't like what I'm saying. It's very difficult. But don't give up. And often, the reason that we don't share our faith is we're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of the repercussions that we'll get relationally. You know, we're more worried about whether the guy, will, a guy or lady will quit liking us if we share our faith with them. We've been friends with them all our life. We went to school together. We're neighbors. We're friends. We're buddies. We, we go on vacations. But I, I'm afraid that they won't be my friend anymore if I tell them about Jesus. Now, this is no secret, but can you imagine? You're, you're afraid on this earth that you're going to lose your best friend because if you tell them about Jesus, they're going to lose your best friend. How's it going to be 
when your so-called best friend, you, you're supposed to be their best friend, they're standing for God, and God's saying, I never knew you. And they're cast into hell for never and ever. They're going to look at you and say, you were my best friend. You were my best friend and you never said a word about Christ? Well, I, 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 I was worried that we would lose our friendship. That's going to be pretty lame then, isn't it? And we're worried about not being a part of the group. We're worried about not being a part of the group if we compromise on things. We're talking about that. Just share Christ. Just share Jesus. Third thing there is we see, these guys got more than they bargained for. I mean, these guys, they were hoping that their friend would walk again, right? I mean, that's what they had desire. I mean, they gave him to Jesus. Jesus can heal him. But verse 20 back in our text, and when he saw their faith, he said, Man, thy sins are forgiven me. And then as we read again, everybody was amazed. They praised God. Lives were changed. They were filled with fear. They were filled with awe and reverence. They said, We've seen remarkable things. They saw what only God could do. Now, a takeaway on this is, don't settle for the mundane when Jesus offers the miraculous. I don't know about you, but I'm very guilty of settling often for the mundane, the ordinary. What can be explained away? You know, we live in a time that advanced technology. You know, we watch things. Some of us remember growing up and you watch things and now you look at it and you think that's kind of hokey. But now as you see things, that can really happen. We have the technology, we have the advancement. So we just kind of explain things away. And we just settle for the mundane and the ordinary. We need to ask God to do what only God can do in our lives and those who do not know Jesus. Some of us, I'm not sure that we believe that that friend, that family member, that neighbor, that coworker can be saved. May we be reminded at one point in our lives, me included, we were the one that needed Jesus. Somebody prayed for us. Could have been a mom, a dad, a grandparent. They're on their knees begging God to save you. They were sharing Jesus for you, to you. May have been a Sunday school teacher. They invited you to church probably numerous times. Many, many times you turned them down. And you kept turning them down. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to go to church. And they kept witnessing. They kept sharing Jesus with you. Their mission was that you, me, us, that we come to faith in Jesus Christ. That was their desire. They had Jesus and they knew that we needed Jesus. So they just kept sharing and kept sharing, and kept living out their faith, and kept talking about the glories of the Lord. And you know what? For those of us that are saved, we received that message of salvation, and you know what? It changed us. Now, I'm on six, next month, I'll be 60 years old, and I was saved when I was seven. And I say that, I praise God, I was saved at a young age, but sometimes God has to remind me, Mike, you were lost one time. And the salvation that you have, you don't deserve. And where you are, what you have, is only by the grace of God. In saying that, sometimes we forget what it's like to be lost. And when we do that, then we isolate ourselves. You know, I believe we need to surround ourselves by godly people. You need to be influenced by godly people, and you want your children to be influenced by godly people, but not in such a way that we ignore a lost and dying world. We have to be intentional. I, I, found in, I find in ministry that you've got to be intentional about talking to lost people. Now, I have this strange thing. Drives my family crazy. When my son was younger, I mean, we'd be in line somewhere, 
and a person I had no idea who they are, they start talking to me. Now, I'm the type of person, when I go to Walmart, I go to a store, I go somebody, somewhere, I want to go in, I want to get my stuff, and I want to get out. Are you guys with me? Amen. All right, you with me? So, you know, somebody to stop me in that store and start talking to me, I'm like, I'm busy. Well, there's a thing called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, Mike, you need to stop. And you need to listen to that person. You may not know them, but they're pouring their life out to you. I mean, people tell you stuff. I don't know if y'all have any of that, do, 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 people do you that way. They will tell me stuff. I'm like, why in the world are you telling me? Ooh, I'm about to step off here. Y'all wouldn't be good with it. Why in the world? Are you? And, and God says, God says, Mike, those people need Jesus. They need Jesus. They need Jesus. I'm, I'm just laying somebody right there at you. You're praying. You're honestly saying, Lord, you know, you know as we do, I, I'm sure y'all do. Lord, today, give me the opportunity to share the gospel. And God's going, there it is. There it is. There it is. Today, I, uh, I was, we, we got Kentucky Changers in, so my job, I'm at, I'm at Lowe's, and I've mean, got the, the association card, so I'm meeting. I bet I'm 15, 20 times at, at Lowe's, but... Every single time, it's the same person behind the register. Now, I'm a little slow, but about after the seventh or eighth time, I finally listen to God, and God says, you know, have you, have you struck up a gospel conversation with her? And, of course, I'm thinking, Lord's going, oh, oh, by the way, do you know what your lesson is tonight, don't you? You might want to put that into practice. Now, I know Brother Keith, he puts all, on the practice, but sometimes I, I, I hadn't always... Live that out, and God says, "Well, by the way, if you're going to teach that, you might want to practice it." So we begin to have a gospel conversation. Praise God, she was saved. She's in, was involved in, in in church, but sometimes we we bypass that. We get in a hurry, we get busy. And like I said, my son, he said, "Dad, you know that person?" I said, "I've never seen them. What are you doing talking to them? They're a stranger." And I was able to tell my son, "It's because God." You know, your dad stands up. And he shares the gospel. He stands on the pulpit and he encourages people to share the gospel. And he needs to live that out. He needs to, I, I need to be an example. So I share with said, that, that lady, that man, that, they need Jesus. They're hurting. Did you listen to what they're saying? I said, they're sharing things that you, you'd never think they would share a strange person because they're hurting. They're lost and they need Jesus. And I got to stop and I got to talk to them because that's what's important. I said, son, you know what that is. I want to get this. I want to get out of here. But what's most important is that life right there. Somebody needs Jesus. And sometimes we just need to slow down a little bit. I have found that, and I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm very guilty, that we're just so busy. You catch your saying, man, I'm just so busy. I'm just so busy. I've got so many things going on. So busy that we don't have time to spend with the Lord. And I confess, even as a minister, you know, you get... As I, when I pastored, man, I'm going to the hospital and I'm praying with people. I'm counseling with people. I'm doing spiritual things, right? But what about my time alone with God? What about God pouring into me and speaking through me and me learning the Word of God? I need to be alone with God. Don't let anything take away from your time with the Lord. Because Satan will do whatever he can. He'll get you up. I mean... I don't know about you, Brother Keith, but times I would, I, would, I would be laying in bed and I'd wake up and I'd be thinking about 20 things I got to do that day. And I'd get up, you know, and the first thing I, I want to do is I want to get ready and I want to jump in there and jump in the car and go wherever I need. And God said, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. You need to spend some time with me. You need to spend some time with me. I'm going to take care of all that other stuff. But what's important, Mike, is you spend time with me. Spend some quality time with me. Get to know me. Because as you go, that busy schedule, not saying it's not, not a busy schedule, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to be go out before you. And I'm going to use you. Because it just don't work doing it in the flesh. It just doesn't. You need the power of God upon your life. And it only happens. By spending time with God. He 
Who is that? Who is that person that you need to share Jesus with? Could it be a parent? Could it be a friend? Somebody you've known, you went to school, best friend? Maybe it's a child. Could it be a grandchild? Could it be a niece? Could it be a nephew? Uh, could it be a neighbor? Could it be a co-worker? Jesus told his disciples, he said, come follow me. I'm going to give you a new mission. I'm going to give you a new task. New direction. When we become Christians, children of God, we got a new focus. We got a new mission. So often, we praise God, we're saved, we're on our way to heaven, praise God for that, but we're, why do you think we're still here on this earth? Is it just to cruise along until God takes us home? No, God wants us to be more like Him, and He wants us to be an ambassador for Him. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to make sure as many people as possible are in heaven. Now, yes, God does the saving, but we are the ones that do the sharing. And I know some of you, you got people that are just hard and you said, man, I've shared with them a thousand times. I remember a man, he was probably about his 80s and his wife was saved and they'd been married for several years and she prayed and she was faithful in church and, um, you know, we're like, pretty sure you need to go visit him. He needs to get saved and we'd go talk to him. And he'd say to me, Brother Mike, you just about went too far. That was the cue. It was time to pack up and head out. That was his cue. It's, it's, it's time to go. You, you just about went too far. And we prayed and we witnessed to him many times. And he was hard and he seemed like it harder and harder. But when he was about 81, 82 years old, he was on an operating table and he just about died on that operating table. He wound up in a nursing home and I went to visit him. And he says to me, we need to talk. Oh, he says, I need to call you and set up an appointment. I said, well, brother, I'm here right now. What do you want to talk about? And I had the privilege of leading that 82-year-old man to the Lord. That man never left the nursing home. But there were times, woo-wee, I was like, his wife said, Ooh, Brother Mike, would you just come by one more time? And I'll be honest, I'd be like, I'm just not sure I'm up for this. Because he had a few adjectives, and he let me know what he thought about God and stuff like that. And I was, and God said, you got to go. you got to go. And I just about, I'll be honest, I just about giving up. And the Lord orchestrated that, and he got saved. 82 years old, never left the nursing home. There was another man. Again, I've, I've had the privilege of baptizing <laughs> Uh, an 80-year-old an man, uh, he actually came to church and he was, um, he was smart on the Old Testament, and, uh, but he didn't believe, he, he was Jewish, he didn't believe the New Testament. Matter of fact, his brother was a rabbi, but his wife was saved, she was a Christian, and one time he had, he had a child to pass away and the church reached out and ministered to him and he called me up and he said, you know, there must be something about this Jesus thing. For people that don't even know me and the way that I act toward them and you minister to me, there must be something about this Jesus thing. And I talked to him many, many times. And I learned a lot about the Old Testament talking to him uh, because he was, he was smart in that area. I mean, that's what he learned. He kind of gave me the, the some Jewish perspective and stuff. And I learned a lot, but... He just couldn't, as many Jews, couldn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But he saw the love of Jesus in a group of folks, some church folks, and he got saved. And I baptized in the lake in, in Trigg County and was able to be a part of his funeral a few years later. I told him, I said, Frank, and he had, he had almost died several times. It was Frank Simon. I said, Frank, God, you don't realize this, but God let you stay alive long enough just so you get saved. You just don't know how blessed you are. And I say that to you, and I can share many stories like that. I'm sure 
Brother Keith and others have shared stories very similar to that. Do not give up. I'll tell you something. When they get the most belligerent, when they get the hardest and the toughest, that's when God's working and Satan is too. The ones I get concerned about is the ones you need to be concerned about are the ones that say, yeah, I'm okay. I'm all right. I, I'm okay. I got, that, I got that religion. I got Jesus. But the ones, man, they, they may be belligerent. They may be hard to get along. And that's when you want to just give up. You're like, man, I, I, I'm just, who I'm at my wit's end. That's when, man, you need to be on your knees and begging God to save them because there's a warfare going on, a warfare for their soul. So don't give up. Because I know some of you, as you sit there, you're, you're thinking about that one. And, and Jim, that one is somebody that you know very well. And you say, you know, I've got a best friend. And I, I've got a best friend, and we do a lot of things together. But they don't want to hear the gospel. I've tried to share Jesus with them. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because maybe we're reminded that God never gave up on us. He saved us, and he changed our lives. And I know... A lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just not comfortable doing that. I'm just not comfortable talking about my faith. Well, we've got to get uncomfortable. It's, it's eternity at stake. Sometimes I just wonder if we truly believe that there's a place called hell. Do we really believe that? That people who do not know Jesus Christ, their personal Savior, that they'll go to a place called hell and burn forever and ever. Because if we really did, we would do whatever it took to get our friends, our family members, our neighbors to Jesus. And I know that we in church, as I talked about, we settle for the mundane so often. Sometimes I'm not sure what we believe. Are they getting ready to come in? Okay. Well, let me just challenge you. All right. Uh, it's good to hear those voices, isn't it? That's great. That's awesome. That's awesome. That, don't sell for mundane. Don't believe God can save and still change lives. I know we're in challenging times and difficult times. This is the time to stand strong. This is the time not to compromise. Don't compromise. Stand strong in your faith. You may be the only one in your family. You may be the only one on your job, and they may be making fun of you. Your family may make fun of you, but stand strong. Because I tell you what, when I was in the business world, I had a lot of people around me before I went in ministry, and I stayed faithful, and some even mocked. But when a crisis happened in their life, they didn't run to their buddies over there. They'd slip over and say, Mike, man, I, I'm going through a divorce. Mike, I, I, I don't know if I can make it any longer. I need to talk to you. You'll be the one they talk to. And those barriers will begin to break down. And you'll praise God that you didn't compromise. You'll praise God that you kept praying. And you kept being faithful to God. Well, let's pray. Lord, I just, uh, wow, thank you.